First of all, I have to tell you that after reading their works, and I greatly encourage you to read their works, you will never feel more humbled. You will feel like a quivering mass of spineless jelly. You will figure that everything you thought you did or decided because you were smart is completely wrong. And, and this is deeply unsettling. And so when we go off into an entire you know, world of communications, influence, and persuasion, thinking that we can logically pull together our message house, our message box, um, you begin to see how much we're fooling ourselves at times by thinking that these things are science when actually there is so much that's scientific but not logical at play here. So let me just walk you through a couple of things first. Uh, as a, a little bit of a recap, if we would go to, I've got it here. This is Charles Lord. Imagine it's 1979 and he's doing what has become a seminal experiment and figuring out how you might change people's minds. And uh, if you're anything like me and do anything like the work I do, you spend a lot of time worrying about trying to change people's minds. Not to dupe them, but to try to either you know, educate them or influence them or move them off an entrenched issue where they may be wrongheaded. Um, and if you're watching anything, I, I live in Washington, D.C., commute up to New York, and in a town like Washington, you know, you see this every minute of every day. So Charles Lord performed an experiment where he basically, and we're going to re-perform it right now, right here. So he took one half and the other half, it's always A-B testing style, and on this half he pre-selected them for, uh, they said they believed that capital punishment works, that it's effective. Not, not any moralistic issue, just if you kill people who do really bad crimes, other people won't do bad crimes because they don't want to die. So this side, for now, play with me, you believe capital punishment is effective. And this side over here, you self-selected, coming in today with Paul Holmes and said, you know what, it's not effective. It's not a moralistic issue. It's just not effective because it could be a crime of passion. It could be something very spontaneous. It is really not something that capital punishment will deter or mitigate in any way. And so he took these two self-selecting groups and he gave them a large body of research to look at. And so just to warm up and to see what he went through, when I point to this side of the room because you believe capital punishment is effective, I'd like you to shout out in a very convincing, persuasive way, fry him. Okay? <laughs> Let's just practice that together for a moment. One, two, three. Fry him. Ooh, you're going to lose. And on this side, because you don't believe, you believe he's a bad guy and he should maybe do time, but, you know, you don't think that you should kill him because, by the way, that just doesn't work. So you're on this side of the room, when I ask you or point to you, you're going to just say, give him time, as in a sentence, right? Give him time. So let's just give it a try and see how you'll do against this weaker crowd over here. Are you ready? One, two, three, give him time. All right, now let's just see how we can play this out in an incredibly intellectual way very quickly. I'm going to stand in the middle and we're going to see what happens, okay? You've got MSNBC and Fox, and it's working beautifully so far. So what he did was in showing them this research, they were delighted. Because when you peeled through the massive research and the summaries that he gave you, you said, just as I suspected, I was right, those morons were wrong. The data proves it. And over on this side, they were flipping through the research and saying, <laughs> you're morons, just as I suspected, the data proves I'm right. And he swapped the research so that they could look at it and wondered how far he might change their minds. So in other words, the research was kind of trumped up, but felt very, very scientific, very official, annotated citations, etc. So that, you know, you looked at it and you said, yeah, this is, you looked at it and said, that's, that's robust research. When they switched the research, I ask you now to predict what happened. And help me, I'm going to walk on a continuum across the stage. This is, right here, 
I never changed my mind seeing the new research that shows I might be wrong because that's what happened. When he swapped the research, it said, you know what? That data you saw on the first one, maybe not so good. You might be wrong on this issue. And the same thing happened with this team. They looked at it and they said, you might be wrong. That first data you saw might not be the most accurate. So having seen the data that says you are wrong in what you believe, let's see how far he went to change their minds. If I get to the other end of the stage, it means I completely changed your mind. If I get halfway, halfway, and a continuum anywhere in between. Now, I challenge you to raise your hand as I get to the degree of mind changing. So if you think they changed their minds halfway, I'll get here and you'll raise your hand. I guarantee you, you're going to look to your left and look to your right and do what everybody else does, so it's a futile task, but we'll try it anyway. So here we go. As I go, you raise your hands and tell me where you thought, how far, to what degree he changed their minds by showing them evidence they were wrong. Okay, there was only one person in the room, a heckler, <laughs> who was correct because you were all wrong. What happened in the experiment was this. When he showed you you were wrong, you got more entrenched in your original point of view. You discounted everything that was evidence, and he coined this term confirmation bias. This was updated with brain scans. Drew Weston has done it in the political sphere, and I won't go through all the details in this one, but suffice it to say that, as he said, nothing in the brain that had anything to do with logic circuits were lighting up, and it was all completely emotion. And in this one, you were looking at your favorite politician versus the politician you hope your favorite politician would beat. And when they flip-flopped, for those of you Americans, you know that's the most dreaded sin of all. Worse than capital crime is the flip-flop. So when they saw evidence their candidate had flip-flopped, um, they excused it and said, oh, my, how smart. He's got new evidence. He's changing his mind. When the other candidate flip-flopped, they said, liar. And so they're telling themselves this little story about their candidates. Well, you remember last year we had Jason uh, Reifler here talking about how difficult it is to change minds and his experiments, including one where if you give people a little bit of self-affirming manipulation first, you can actually change their minds more readily. So if you ever watch Saturday Night Live, if you're as old as I am, you remember Stuart Smiley standing in front of the mirror saying, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, they like you. Turns out you do that, you actually have more success changing people's minds, even though I've obviously dumbed it down. Now I'm gonna ask you right now, when uh, one case, have you recently tried to change anybody's mind on behalf of your client? Anybody here? This is what you do for a living. You did? <laughs> just tell me, what was it? What were you trying to change? Here, quick, just a summary. Uh, basically, they didn't Go ahead, go for it. They did not want to engage in social media because they didn't think that their audience was on social media. And they thought they said, no, all of our buyers are 55 plus. And then I said, well, then all your buyers are going to be dead. Or, d you know, or... I turned 55 last week! What no, are you but they were basically saying they're going to be retired in 10 years, so you're not going not gonna to have any more buyers, yeah? So you need to create a new audience. But it was very difficult because, yeah. Okay, you good do? one. Who else? Who else has tried to change an audience's mind on behalf of your client? Anybody? You're cow. I know you have. <laughs> yes, you have. What have you done? What have you done to change somebody's mind? Change my mind. <laughs> it's okay. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. So uh, what, how many of you have gone into the myths versus facts sort of approach? You know when it's unfair, when your client's under attack, or it's an issue you've been hired to weigh in on on behalf of a client? Have you ever used the myths versus facts approach? I mean, that's a pretty, I would suggest probably all of you, those of you who are tweeting, he's a moron, hashtag Graves moron right now, I would suggest that you probably have used this at some point. Most communicators have, or clients have asked you to, even if you didn't want to. Um, we will figure out uh, why, in many cases, this is a total backfire. If you remember the Charles Lord approach, often more evidence, in fact, more in-depth evidence gets worse and worse and worse. But there is a way, and I'm going to show you one uh, right now, and this is a way to 
change minds through what these guys are brilliant at and what Melanie Green, you should look at her research about um, narrative influence, narrative persuasion, the science of changing minds with narrative. And let me show you one approach. Imagine you were trying to change minds on this issue. This is, this is a myths versus facts on same-sex marriage. But what if you did it a different way? You do me a favor and just hover over it. No, go back. There's a video. There you go. Just pop that in there. There you go. We have a very special relationship. Some people don't understand, but we do. Jill was a very good baby, just smiling and bubbling. She was just so cute. Oh, boy. You always have great expectations for your children. My expectations of what Jill's life was going to be included a husband. So when Nikki came to ask permission to marry our little girl, that startled me. I told her, this is not the dream I had for my daughter. I didn't say yes, I didn't say no. Coming out to the wedding from back east, I had some real apprehensions about it. What's this going to look like? Two girls getting married. You have to make a decision. Are you going to have a daughter that you are going to maintain a very wonderful relationship for the rest of your life? Or are you going to lose that child? This was a situation that I had to come to understand. Once we got out to California and we saw how happy they were, all that trepidation just seemed to go away. That, you know, that was a big, big turning point. Of course, walking Jill down the aisle, just looking at her, she was breathtakingly beautiful. Judy and I were just swelling with the motion. You come to terms with it and you say, this is the very natural order of things in your life, and it's supposed to be this way. When Jill was born, there was a certain spark in her eye and a glow in her heart that quickly became very apparent to Judy and I. When she got a little older, and all of a sudden, that spark that I looked for in your eyes, in your heart, I didn't see. And it pained us greatly. And all of a sudden, bam, there's Nikki, and that spark is back. And there you go. So, quite a different approach than facts versus myths. Let me tell you a little bit about David McRaney. He's a journalist, he's an author. He came out with a bestseller, You Are Not So Smart, and his uh, just published sequel to that, You Are Now Less Dumb. He has brought uh, 20 of them signed here, and we're going to put them to you in escrow. You cannot have them yet. When you ask a really fascinating, challenging question, you can have one. But they're going to sit up and be ready to go for you you know, so they're going to decline, though, as time goes by, we're going to start having to take these books away if you're not asking the questions. So this is a principle called loss aversion if you read Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. If you present or frame things to audiences as a loss, avoiding a loss, Kahneman found, is two to three times more powerful than the thrill of a gain. So he brought the books, but you may not get them. So, he, of course, hopes you'll not only get them, you'll pay for them, but there you go. Then we also have Melanie Green. Melanie has been the editor of these volumes, Narrative Impacts, Social and Cognitive Foundations, and Persuasion, Psychological Insights and Perspectives. By the way, uh, David's uh, Twitter handle is at David McRaney. And do you have a Twitter handle? Her Twitter handle is Melanie Green to be determined. (laughs) (coughs) And I'd like to now 
toss it over to you guys because you have, in your own ways, been such deep thinkers about this. Talk to me a little bit, David, in the huge amount and the years of research you've done in compiling these books. Why is it so difficult to change a human being's mind? Um, I would say that uh, your greatest obstacle is in the fact that narratives are so important to each of us and that um, yourself is uh, basically a narrative construction, a sort of a narrative is like a cohesion engine that, uh, and correct me if I'm going off the rails, um, a cohesion engine that tells you who you are, why you are, and puts you in the, in the course of uh, time. It, it gives you the timeline that says, I'm here now because of this, 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 and this. Um, in absence of anything better to, uh, to make sense of how the world is, is operating around you, you will invent a narrative. A uh, great example that uh, one of my favorite um, studies ever in the history of psychology is the Capilano Canyon Bridge Experiment. Uh, they had this long suspension bridge. Say that again slowly. So Capilano Canyon Bridge Experiment, Aaron Dutton. So they have a suspension bridge in uh, British Columbia. It looks like the, the bridge that Indiana Jones goes across and uh, fights all the dudes on. Uh, so it's really, really scary. You can go there now still and, and get on it. And as you go across it, you can feel every other person's step on the bridge. It's, in, it's just terrifying. And as you look over the edge of it, you can see that if you were to fall over, you would go to your death because it's about the height of the uh, Statue of Liberty underneath it. What they did is they put a, um, a confederate, uh, a woman who was working for the scientist, in the center of that bridge. And as men would walk by, she would ask, hey, would you like to take part in this study that we're doing? And then men would, some of the men would say yes. And if they said yes, they had to answer this questionnaire on the spot. And then uh, she took the paper and turned it over and wrote uh, her number and said, look, if you have any questions about how this uh, experiment was conducted or if you have any follow-up questions, this is my number and you can call me at. And the men would move on. They then uh, went to a really sturdy bridge that didn't even need to be there. It was like uh, just an ornamental bridge. And they conducted the exact same experiment in every way. Woman on the bridge, men passed by, number the whole thing. And then they, to quantify the research, what they wanted to see was how many of the men would then call that number later, thinking that actually she was trying to uh, get some sort of romantic thing going on between them. She thought that, so that, that there was something happening there in that moment. And they found that on the suspension bridge, the scary one, 50% of the men called back thinking that she was looking for a date. And on the sturdy bridge, 12.5% of the men called back. Because what had happened was, and it's a known effect in psychology now, it's called the misattribution of arousal. Uh, misattribution of arousal. Misattribution of arousal. So How many of you suffer from that? <laughs> <laughs> so you think about, they're attributing the state that they're feeling. I'm scared as hell. This is weird. I have all these elevated emotions. Uh, they, um, they're experiencing arousal, psychologically speaking, arousal is a very high elevated emotional state. A political speech, a super awesome solo will make you feel aroused. Uh, and they were like, what is causing that? Uh, and they speculated that they created a narrative in the moment. What, well, I need to make sense of myself. I need to make sense of my feelings. And a nice self-serving and pleasant narrative that I can construct is that this lady is interested in me and we have something going on here. There's some chemistry and that's why I feel what I feel. And since the effect didn't take place on the other bridge, it, it supports that the evidence supports the conclusion. And they did other research that was more controlled, that wasn't quite as out there in the world. And uh, the evidence has stacked up more and more that we do tend to mis misattribute our arousal. So that, you know, practical advice, if you want to, you should take a date to get coffee because the elevated state you get from the caffeine, they may misattribute <laughs> to the partner. Um, <laughs> but the, the great advice for a group like this is know that people construct narratives on the fly all the time because we're unaware, first of all, of how unaware we are. And we tend to be the unreliable narrator in the story of our lives, and we tend to be very self-serving. So people will, in, in moments of ambiguity, they will construct a narrative. And you want to be mindful of when you are presenting your case with a corona, I call this my own jargon, but a corona of ambiguity will be filled in by, uh, by people with unconsciously and uh, automatically. So. so when, if you look back at Charles Lord's experiment, and I'm giving you evidence, as we so often try to do, that, you know, David, you're just wrong on this. Uh, why, what is it that in our, in our makeup or our evolution that forces us to reject that rather than even begin to consider that? What's going on 
that makes that so difficult for us to take on board. And experiment after experiment after experiment reconfirms this. Can we go? Well, I mean, one of the interesting things is that it's in that experiment is that they're not just rejecting it. It's they're not just saying, I'm not going to look at this. What they're doing is they're looking at it and they're picking it apart. They're saying, I don't think that sample was right. They didn't use the right technique. They didn't use the right comparison. And so it's even more sophisticated than that, that they're using it. Um, it's not just a flat rejection. We're bringing in other kinds of processes. And part of that is that once we've committed to an attitude, there's cognitive reasons why you don't want to change because it's linked to all these other attitudes. And if you shake up one piece of this puzzle, how many other things does that influence? And how many other things do you have to rethink? And that takes a lot of cognitive energy. It relates to our social groups. If everybody around me, if my friends and my church all believe in this, and then I suddenly go changing my mind, what's going to happen? So there's a lot of forces that kind of come into play that make this a, a But is it a issue. loss of face? Is it that as a human, I just you know, feel like I'm, I'm a, a lesser person if I change my mind? Or is it a, an identity with a worldview? What is that's going on psychologically mm -hmm. that makes it so tough analytically? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, th I think you've hit on it. I think that's, it's that identity with the worldview. It's, and like David was saying a minute ago, being part of ourselves, these mm -hmm. processes all folding in with each other. The self is a, I mean, the self is a story. I mean, it is a story that we, we, we tell ourselves who we are minute by minute. David. We know when a person goes into a, you've seen the um, uh, people get in those centrifuges, pilots get in centrifuges, they go in low G, they get in high Gs and the blood is sucked out of their brain for a minute and they basically die and then they come back awake. Uh, and then near-death experiences. In those moments, the, the people get all these crazy flashes, uh, random images flash through their mind, and they always construct a story around what, what happened. They'll say, uh, you know, th and if they're deeply religious, it'll, be, it'll have a religious tone to it. If they're not, then it maybe it'll be fantastical. Maybe they astral projected somewhere. Um, but the first thing that really, you know, what happens in that moment is they assemble themselves back together again, and, and then the story starts to make sense. And well, the really one of the last things that we give up as a, as a creature is that sort of narrative engine that tells us who we are and why we're sitting where we are right now. And um, when you threaten someone's sense of narrative, you sense their, their sense of self and their sense of narrative, you're threatening the same thing. Uh, and I would speculate that... Um, you know, you, you don't, people don't want to feel inconsistent. They don't want to feel inconsistent with, who, with, the, with the character that they've created that they believe themselves to be. And a lot of times when you give people attitude and consistent information, when you present it to them and challenge them with it, you're challenging them to rewrite the character that they've invented. And that's a very scary and daunting process because where you go from there. And we may not, uh, that, that may not rise to the surface. We might think that out loud in our minds, you know, but we, uh, I think that it does, we do have sort of a, a um, intuitive gut punch feeling and, and we sh we move straight to defending things that we normally wouldn't defend i've got in arguments over things like which is better a playstation or a xbox and uh i'm like why am i defending this product um <laughs> the corporation doesn't care if <laughs> which one i like uh but it's because i've 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 been you have identified i've identified with it it's because i'm part of the tribe of people that has this thing right. not the tribe that has that thing. so it then goes beyond the logic of of a, of a better outcome in this decision, it is will I be in some way expelled from my tribe if I try to adopt a worldview that is in conflict with my tribe? So it sounds to me like there's a whole lot of identity baggage tied up in changing people's minds. Melanie, you've spent so long on narrative mm -hmm. as a persuasive tool. And you saw the two examples here, the sort of evidentiary approach of facts versus myth, which many of us, if not all of us, have done at some point, and the narrative approach, both addressing same-sex marriage. Would you have any inkling as to which might be more effective and why? Mm -hmm. Right, and, and that's what a lot of my research has looked at, is the way that, that those kinds of narratives, so David's been talking about narrative as this broad structure, and we can also think of narratives as the story about the man and, and his daughter, these kinds of things that we can tell in an advertisement or as part of a campaign, these kinds of things. And what, what we found is that what narrative can do 
is evoke a different mindset. When we see these math, um, myths and facts, we're starting to evaluate things, we're bringing these potentially critical capacities of our minds to deal with that. But when we see a story, what we're often doing is what we've called getting transported into that narrative world. We're stepping into the lives of these characters. And what's going on there is it's immersive, it's enjoyable, we're not being critical, we're not counter-arguing, and so those kinds of things can break down some of the initial barriers that we're gonna have to be persuaded. Um, but then what it can also do once we're in that narrative world is create those connections that are so important. We're mentally simulating, we're taking the perspective of, of, these, of these people, and that empathy that creates those connections that we, can, we create goes out and we carry it beyond just those few moments that we were thinking about the story. Mm -hmm. is what can happen. So is there a technique, would you say, that works better than another? Uh, there I'd seen one piece of research where they had taken a Chekhov short story right. and redone it as legal briefs mm -hmm. versus the short story and found that in a legal brief format, the facts were the same but didn't change anybody's view. Right. So is there a magic to narrative that goes beyond just the logical sequence of, of events there? Uh, that's a great question. I think there is a magic to narrative, but I don't think anyone's come up with the cookbook <laughs> yet for what there is. I mean, certainly you can look at, there's a million books on yeah. how to write stories that talk about plot and conflict and resolution and, and production values, all those kinds of things. And all of those sorts of things matter. And I think at the heart of it is creating some kind of connection, but there are a variety of different ways to do that, of, of creating these characters that grab you, of allowing people to see themselves in the person, the story, of, of getting people swept away sometimes mm -hmm. in you know, big budget productions. I think there are a lot of different pathways, but the important part is do you get people to that state where they are in this immersive frame of mind. And, right. and this can happen quick. I mean, there's, there's studies from consumer psychology. They give people a little one-page print ad with a little bit of text about imagine yourself running through the woods. We're so good at this. We're so used to doing this from a young age that, that you can yeah. get into it. Ernest Hemingway won a short story contest. Uh, here's the short story. Um, baby shoes for sale, never worn. Mm. Now, that's incredibly powerful because 99% of the work is on behalf is the the uh, audience has to make up that story. What does that mean? You know, that's the whole tip of the iceberg thing that he was so into, right? The story is beneath the water, and you tell the rest of the story. Um, I the storytelling is what I is what I'm most interested in, right? So uh, taking science and turning it into stories. Um, I look at that commercial uh, or that that uh, campaign you showed, and what I think people identify with in that is. Okay, so people who don't agree with same-sex marriage, they can't identify with perhaps the, the idea of same-sex marriage, but they can identify with the, this character's struggle to overcome what he disagrees with for the love of his family. And that's what you identify with is the character's struggle. And in most of the stories that we enjoy, we identify not with characters that we think are like us or characters that we think are, um, uh, that they're, that match a lot of our characteristics, but we do identify with their actions, the verbs, you know, the verbs matter more than adjectives, right? We want, we love characters who overcome adversity and who face struggles because we all feel that we're facing some sort of struggle and we're trying to move against adversity. And so if you, uh, you may or may not like Walter White in Breaking Bad. I was just thinking when you were saying, <laughs> <laughs> how many of you are Breaking Bad fans? Did you yeah. stick with Walter White to the end, regardless? Right. I mean, no. th this was the man overcoming, this was the right. struggle? So, I mean, imagine Walter White's your client. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, he is. Okay. No, no. <laughs> but the idea is that uh, we're compelled, we even root for him beyond the point that he deserves it because we identify with his struggle. And the thing, the, I, I would say that what you're saying to yourself is, um, I have things that I'm facing in my life as well. And I, I recognize how tough it is. This guy really has it tough. Would I act like him like in, in that situation? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But I totally am invested in seeing how he, how he overcomes this struggle. So uh, when you can identify the struggle of someone who's in a precarious situation, that is a very compelling story to tell. Now, how much do these stories, so if you want to change somebody's mind, you create a narrative and it gives them a little bit of distance, almost like a flight simulator. 
so that their identity of their self is no longer at risk here. Do I have that right so far? Mm -hmm. So that's one effort that we, we make is we try to give the person whose mind we're trying to change or audience whose mind we're trying to change a little bit of safety zone by saying, I, I, it's not about you, I'm not going to make you in trouble with your tribe because of trying to change your worldview. It's this story or this guy over here I'd like you to go on a journey with and allow you like a flight simulator to just try that out. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's certainly part of it. So one of the things that, that we talk about is it's sort of the optimal emotional distance where, um, and some of this comes out of things like therapy, so that, um, that's where some of those emotional distance terms come from. But the idea that you can take a step back and think about these things without the spotlight on you. You're not having to defend it. You're not having to um, get all of these self things tied up in there. But that story lets you think about it. And particularly, you were talking about the Chekhov short story. One thing that especially good narratives do is maybe have that little twist that makes you think about the world in a slightly different way. You know, we get on these, these mental ruts or these tracks of how we start thinking about some things, but then a little turn of phrase or just something a character does can break us out of those things and get us to think about it. So there's a lot of levels on which that Now, what about work. changing minds? You know, there's, there's the uh, availability heuristic, the frequency bias, the fluency bias. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of these cognitive biases, but these in particular are about humans being so weak that <laughs> if they, they go with what they last heard, right? Sure. That they, and particularly if it's been repeated and repeated and repeated. So on the one hand, we accept this uh, real epiphany that we have to create a narrative to change somebody's minds. And then you get back into sort of a compl political campaigning mindset and it's about hammering, hammering, hammering the same message because somebody's gonna take that away as truth because they heard it frequently and they heard it recently. Is that something that you know you try, you can ever overcome? Um, okay, so a lot of people ask this question, uh, how do we overcome bias? How do we stop doing this? I always say you can't. You, this is part of who you are. We have two arms, two legs, we have blood, we have hearts, That's and our brains have biases in them, and that's just the way it is, because they're adaptive. Over a long evolutionary history, it's been better most of the time for us to be biased in certain ways than not, and so we've inherited a lot of these biases. Some of them we get through our lifetime, through culture, and some of them we're born with. Um, the uh, confirmation bias, for example, if, uh, if you're looking for your keys, uh, the first place, you should seek confirmation of where you think they might be first. Uh, so you shouldn't go look for them in Idaho first. You shouldn't <laughs> get out a telescope and look on the moon to see if they're on the moon. You should look on your kitchen counter first. In that case, confirmation bias, totally okay. Um, if you aren't very familiar with mushrooms, uh, I had a scientist tell me this. Uh, <laughs> not personal experience. No, no. If you're not very, <laughs> if you're not very familiar with mushrooms, uh, you shouldn't just walk into the woods and be, if you're hungry and go, I think I'll just eat that mushroom. You should be biased to assume that all mushrooms are. So there's an evolutionary. Exactly. Reason. So so bias is adaptive in that sense. You get into situations that we're not really, uh, you know, that our uh, protein brain isn't ready for, like. Uh, giant governments, giant situations, same-sex marriage, these weird things that take a lot of, of in-depth thinking and reasoning, um, bias isn't so good because that shortcut to thinking becomes a, a hindrance instead of a, you know, a boon. Uh, so that's when you have to dig in deeper. We were talking earlier that, uh, here's a weird example, like this is an actual study. Um, they ask people to, to sort of ruminate on how assertive they are as, as, as against the average person. How assertive are you? And think about that yourself right now. How assertive am, am I? And they had half of the, they had divided people into two groups. And one group was asked to uh, come up with six things, six memories that they could, uh, in six moments in which they felt they had been assertive. And then the other group was asked to come up with 12 moments in which they thought they had been assertive. And the people who were asked to come up with 12 did come up with 12 examples. But then later, uh, the two groups were asked to fill out a questionnaire saying, how assertive do you think you are as a human being? And the people who had to come up, who were tasked to come up with six examples believed that they were more assertive people than the people that came up with 12 examples. So the number, the amount of evidence they were able to produce was not the determining factor. It was how easy it was to produce that evidence. The feeling of ease, the cognitive load was lower made them feel, since they could come up with examples more easily, they, were, they felt themselves, that must mean I must be a really assertive person, despite the fact they didn't come up with as many examples as the other group. And they were unaware of the other group. Um, 
when you're trying, uh, that can be applied to trying to get people to change their minds. Uh, when you're trying to uh, dump a whole lot of info on a person, um, saying, look at, all, look at all this giant amount of evidence that says that this is a myth and this is true, uh, the more powerful approach is uh, a, sm a, a uh, shorter list, a fewer examples that are more powerful and stickier than it is to try to overload somebody with a mountain of evidence. A scientist will be convinced by a mountain of evidence because scientists are trained to think in those terms, but a lay person is not. And uh, the easier it is for you to think in your mind, oh yeah, well that, 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 and that, the faster it will be for the, uh, and the easier it will be for a person to switch out of myth. Yeah, so although interesting, ahead, even scientists, the advice that you're given for writing for scientific journals is make it a good story, right? It's a little different story. You're not making up fiction, but making it easy. So mm -hmm. yeah, even scientists. Okay, do we have the stack of books? Bring them up. Come on up. Our lovely assistant, Stephanie Manis, with the books. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie. Get your adapted dig in. Here we go. I'm going to stack up what you could lose right here. <laughs> Testing Kahneman, yeah. Kahneman's theory of loss aversion right. and prospect theory. Imagine how lonely your room will be without this book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just, you know, for those of you who are smug out there and, and thinking that you um, maybe have fewer biases than, than the rest of us, uh, David, if you would just speed read down oh, yeah. the list of chapters really fast right. to show you what you're afflicted the with sitting right here right now. And mind you, the first book had 46 of these. And yeah. I so now you're better. Well, yeah, and I made these a little longer, so there are fewer of them, but narrative bias, common belief bias, the Benjamin Franklin effect, post hoc fallacy, halo effect, ego depletion, misattribution of arousal, <laughs> illusion of external agency, backfire effect, pluralistic ignorance, the no true Scotsman fallacy, illusion of asymmetric insight, and cognition, cognition, de individuation, sunk cost fallacy, or justification effect, and self enhancement bias. And that's. that's and if you have an erection for more than four hours, <laughs> <laughs> see your doctor. So that's, that's 17 out of, I don't know. 1,100 identified biases with, with scientific literature to back up the... Phenomenal. So we had a whole series of questions. Question right here. <laughs> oh, look at this. Come on up, Mr. Holmes. So I wouldn't normally do this, but I really want one of those books. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this topic, as Christopher knows. And this, this whole discussion has fed into something that... I had coined as a sort of smart-ass aphorism a, a, a little while ago, and I, I wanted to sort of explore it a little bit. So I started saying a while ago that I thought that um, public relations people were Democrats and advertising people were Republicans. <laughs> and what I, what I meant by that was that, and you can see this in the debate over health care right now, okay? So Democrats believe that if they just repeat over and over again the, the statistics, more people, are, many more people are going to be helped by this than are going to be hurt. We're giving insurance to millions of people who didn't have it before, um, that that's going to win the debate. Whereas Republicans understand that rolling out one person who couldn't use the website properly or whose health care premium went up by $50 because they had to give up their, their policy um, is a much more powerful means of communication. So you have this imbalance, and I may be a little biased in thinking it's always Democrats on one side and Republicans on the other, but you have this imbalance between people who really believe that the facts will prevail and people who really believe that a few great anecdotes will always trust the facts. And in public relations, we're almost in the same place. We are the people who will give you, the reporter, this huge sheet of data and a white paper and a detailed explanation of why this is a great idea. And the advertising people will, in a, with a 30-second film, I don't know how long that film was that we About saw earlier. Minutes, okay. But in a 30-second film, bring tears to your eyes and make an emotional connection. How do we as, there is a question, not just the speech, <laughs> but how do, how do we as public relations people learn to inject that kind of emotion into our stories without becoming either manipulative? Well, it might be manipulative, but honest. Okay. All right. You just but, don't want to be unethical. But yeah, without, without stepping over some sort of line or without compromising, you know, what we, we, uh, believe is a very necessary integrity. Melanie, why don't you kick off with that? And Mr. Holmes, here, the very <laughs> first signed one. So, 
Actually, if you could sign my Kindle instead, that would be <laughs> much more useful, but he will. <laughs> you can go to my website, I can do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Melanie, give it a shot. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that actually resonates. I, I was able to come to some of the sessions yesterday and heard a lot about storytelling and finding the truth of your brand and that integrity. And I think getting the stories in there is just making that those connections that you maybe already see from what your organization is doing or what the company is doing and then who are the people that are that are that are affected by that and you find that once or here's how something that we're doing makes someone's life better here's how what we're doing um, change something in the world and all you need to do with a story is get that concrete example of here's the person or here's the small group that that experience that event. You're just taking these broad principles and getting them into an experience. And it doesn't have to, again, it doesn't have to be the great American novel. It doesn't even have to be two minutes. It's just connecting with a specific person telling sort of the, the truth of their journey or their experience. Now that so. specific person is a behavioral economics principle in its own right, mm -hmm. which I fully subscribe to. If you get into this discussion amongst yourselves or with your clients, about uh, telling a story. Do you tell a story of a group of people, uh, a whole country of people, or a team of people, or a family? There's an entire field of research called the identifiable victim effect, or the identifiable victim phenomenon, which actually you can turn away from victim to something very uplifting as well. And all it means is this, that human empathy doesn't scale. When I tell you that in the Philippines, 10,000 might be dead, at some level you go, gosh, that's terrible. When I tell you the story of one little girl and that her name is Susan and that she lost her brother Bobby, her mother Patricia, her father Richard, and I describe her in detail and what they were up against, it doesn't matter about the 10,000, you're all in for the one. And if you look at politicians, there is one Democrat that does this brilliantly, Paul, and that's Bill Clinton. He has always understood the storytelling, the narrative, forget about what political bench you're from, he's just great at understanding intuitively the identifiable victim effect. So talking about healthcare, you would talk about one person, not about the mm -hmm. statistics, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. So taking Melanie's advice with narrative, and then funnel that one by one. Doesn't mean a spokesperson, that's completely different. It means uh, somebody who embodies uh, the story you're talking about, but just one at a time, and you might have to have more than one at, you know, sequentially, because there's this whole other thing. Talk to us a little bit about in-groups and out-groups and homophily for a moment, David. In other words, if you look at somebody, instantly your brain has decided, are they possibly in my in-group or are they in my out-group? And if they're in the out group, it's really hard to accept what they're going to say when they're trying to change your mind. Um, Sharif did this great experiment, uh, the Robert's Cave experiment. Um, it was an experiment in his, uh, the, the question, he had his reasons, but one of the questions that he wanted to know is, is culture, does culture, will culture form in a vacuum? You know, do we, do we uh, how much of our culture do we inherit? How much do we invent generation to generation and so on? Um, he got a group of kids, this is very unethical stuff. And uh, they would never do this in modern psychology. <laughs> but uh, it was back in the day you could do anything. Um, Very unethical. <laughs> super unethical. <laughs> so uh, he basically had this uh, camp, like, you know, a, a summer camp. And he brought a whole bunch of uh, boys to the summer camp. And uh, unbeknownst to the boys, he had brought a separate group of boys to the other side of the camp. And um, basically just sort of let them create their own tribes. Um, and they very quickly, within a week, started creating their own uh, rituals and... Um, uh, things you could and could not say, could and could not do, things you had to say before you ate, uh, a hierarchy of command formed spontaneously, and a lot of the stuff they inherited from their culture. It's Lord of the Flies kind it of Exactly thing. is what it was. And a lot of the stuff they inherited from their culture, the some of these ideas they inherited, and some of them they, they invented whole cloth. Um, but the really the point of the experiment was to see what would happen whenever they discovered there was another group of kids on the, on the, uh, at the camp. And uh, he had them slowly discover each other over time, uh, and eventually, you know, they were like, hey, I think there's some other people, and then they started, and he, then they were observed, they, and they were saying, as soon as they learned there was another group of people, uh, another group on, on the, um, at the camp, they immediately started disparaging them. Like, everything they did was the wrong way to do everything, and if it resembled things that they were doing, they stopped doing it that way and started doing it some other way. 
Um, they created uh, mascots, which became more like totems, uh, eagles versus uh, snakes. Rattlers. Yeah. Ra rattlers, right. And you know, and this, so the rattlers came up with, with sort of creating these uh, mythological tales of how the rattler would kill the eagle, and the eagle would kill the rattler. And it just became really strangely tribal and primal. And uh, of course, the scientists upped the ante. They made them play baseball against each other and all sorts of other stuff, and uh, they nearly killed each other. One of the groups started committing raids against the other group at, at night and stealing items from them. Um, and the items that they stole, they would uh, had uh, um, religious properties where they, the person who had the item that was stolen would keep it. And they would do strange things like uh, kiss the medallions. And they just became really, really, really tribal and primal. And yet just normal kids. Normal kids. Middle and America. the only thing that happened was they formed a group, and then there was another group. And... Um, they immediately decided that group, everything about them was wrong and everything about us is right. And the other group thought the same thing. And those groups didn't even exist before the experiment. But in, the, in that story, there's a silver lining. Uh, he was able to start to get them to um, stop doing those things and to see the other group as a human beings by uh, having things happen, like have the, the bus that was going to take them home break down. And the only way that they could fix it is if everybody worked together. <laughs> and he was able to start to dissolve those groups by letting everybody understand, guess what? We're all human beings. So there is a little bit of a silver line of that crazy experiment. Mm. Yes. One right here. Yeah. Sorry, one second. We'll, we'll get the microphone to you. Would the behavioral dimension have changed if there had been girls in that group? Great question. Well, one of the fascinating things about that study is that doing it at that level with taking kids to camp is not something that's that's going to be repeated. But this getting in groups and out groups to form, you can do it at the drop of a hat. You just give people red t-shirts and blue t-shirts, boom, you know. And it, does it go as far as the you know stealing things from other people? And, you know, no. But can you evoke that in group out group sense very very easily across genders, ages? doesn't matter, very robust. So in that. changing minds though, you want to be very sensitive that you're not pissing off the tribe whose mind you're trying to change, right? Yes, right here. Hi, I'm Laura Sean, and I actually um, agree, I'm fascinated by this discussion, and I want to highlight to the authors that you guys sell books too, because uh, due <laughs> to last year's session, I actually bought your book, Melanie of Persuasion. <laughs> well, Bravo. thank you very much. Anyhow, but my question is the following. I'm a little bit confused about can we actually succeed in terms of changing people's minds? Because um, thinking about the question that Chris asked, a challenge that we face, well, the challenge I'm facing, I'm trying to change people's minds about lung cancer. Lung cancer is heavily associated with smokers. And there is a whole bias in terms of people brought that disease to themselves, they're responsible for the disease. And even in terms of the physician's treatment protocol, it's different because they don't go as far as they would go for somebody with colon cancer. Mm. So yes, you can bring the example of the young woman who has never smoked, but are you guys telling me that we can never actually change, that a change is just going to be decades of influencing, or how do you advise me to try to change <coughs> that bias? Mm -hmm. oh, I'll say something really fast and I'll defer to you. Uh, be aware that our opinions don't come to us through rational thought, okay? Most of the time our opinions come to us, we don't even know where they come from. The, the process that brings us to the beliefs and opinions we hold is invisible to us. Uh, it's the result of thinking not that we experience, not thinking itself. Um, so that's an important thing to remember. Uh, there is a st tale from neuroscience where this uh, gentleman had, had a, a, a has a lesion in his brain and he's no longer able to feel normal human emotion and you would think that would turn him into Spock and he would be able to do everything logically and he'd be a superhuman but uh, when you ask that person to fill out a questionnaire and you say would you like to use a red pen or a blue pen it's impossible for them to come to a decision uh, if you take that person to a cereal aisle and say pick out a cereal for you to eat for breakfast tomorrow paralyzed cannot make a decision and because decision making is not rational it is not logical it is not some sort of uh, you know, we, we created science so that we could have logic and reason and apply it to decision making. Re decision making is deeply emotional and um, it comes from intuitive places. So you, that's where you have to strike if you want to change minds, is in, in, that, in that place. Uh, I was really moved by the campaign for the, to stop smoking that had the woman who, sa who slowly put on all of her, uh, her hair and everything. And that, to me, did more to disparage the idea of being a smoker than 
uh, all of those campaigns from the 2000s that were like, hey, don't be stupid, here's the statistics and all these things. Th those don't mean anything to me. Human beings mean things to me. And you have to grab people and make decisions at the emotional Much more level. implicit than injunction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And just because the research on, on biases and on people holding on to their attitudes, you know, yeah, it's not an easy problem, but it's not an unsolvable problem. We change people's attitudes all the time. I mean, you, you look at that from everything from advertising campaigns to the shift in you know, civil rights movements. Uh, it's certainly something that can be done, but it's just a matter of some problems are harder than others. And I think it's th the problem that you're dealing with is an unfortunate dark side of how successful anti-smoking campaigns are that suddenly people have made this leap too far. Um, but doing things like helping people to connect, you know, imagine how it would feel to be someone you're struggling with cancer and then you're being blamed on top of it. I mean, I think that kind of resonates with people. So some of those directions of, like David just said, you know, bringing in the emotions. And, and it's not that, you can't, that facts don't have a place as well, but if you get people into those stories and maybe that opens them up to the fact that, hey, X percent of people who have this disease have never smoked. I mean, you know, not to mention the point that... In, in fact, there <laughs> yeah, isn't exactly. there a role for facts that you need to arm people with what they use mm -hmm. to tell other people why they changed their mind or made a decision? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, they to curb. There's a term in psychology called pluralistic ignorance. Uh, it would take too long to talk about it, but basically, it's when everybody thinks something on the inside, but but presents something else on the outside, so nobody realizes that they're in the majority opinion because it doesn't look like they are on the outside. Uh, that's a really big big problem on college campuses with binge drinking. Uh, no one wants to binge drink, everyone binge drinks, and then everyone thinks that everyone wants to binge drink, but everyone actually doesn't want to binge drink on the inside. <laughs> That's plural. <pluralistic. laughs> uh, the way that they've combated that very effectively is just to put up flyers that say, the majority of students on, 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 on this campus don't like binge drinking. A kind of social proof, Cialdini kind exactly. of social proof. So you realize you're actually now we're going to get into our lightning yeah. round because we're out of time. So it's going to be like 30 seconds each <laughs> for each of these, and we'll see if we can get through this pile of book before it disappears. Okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Go ahead. Do we have a microphone somewhere already? Did I did I miss somebody? Hi. Uh, storytelling is becoming. Well, that'd be very very fast because I'm going over here. Storytelling increasing buzzword for PR and advertising. Consumers are being bombarded by messages. What is the capacity to take on all these stories that are coming through TV spots, advertising shows, talks at the water cooler? How do humans absorb all of these stories that are coming at them? And are there t tips to cut through the clutter? Boy, that's a great question. I, one thing that's on your side is that people are so used to, as stories are such a fundamental way of thinking that we have a bigger capacity for them than we do for other kinds of information. Um, but cutting through, make them ones that connect with people, mm -hmm. do a good job. I mean, this is not going to be news to anybody, but, but make, it still make works. Make them don't suck. Mm -hmm. Okay, last one here, and then I'm going to ask that David takes his books right over there and you beat each other to a bloody pulp to see <laughs> who can get. To, here's one right here. opposed to who tells the story. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about trust? It's something we haven't heard in, in influence. Mm -hmm. Is there a big difference between having someone give a narrative of someone there's a pre-existing relationship? And if so, how do you see social is going to play a part in changing? Great question. Um, you know, I think, I think audiences are very savvy and, um, and cynical at the same time. So uh, you want to, the person telling the story needs to be part of the actual real story. That's what, that's what I would say. Uh, anyone who's famous enough for you to recognize them, they better be a, a real neutral character, otherwise people are going to immediately say, well, he's for that team, and everything he says is biased, and you have to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. So those who had had their hands up just a second ago, don't cheat, because we've been watching, we'll replay the video. <laughs> those of you who had had your hands up, put them back up right here. So if you folks would then make your way right over there with David to his books, who had been bold enough like Stephen there, to put their hands up, uh, and, and again, don't cheat. Uh, meet him over there, and I'm sure he'll tell you where you can find more of them if he runs out, can't you? Mm -hmm. okay. Join me in thanking our panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> Melanie Green, professor of psychology, UNC. David McRaney, author and journalist. Thank you.